arcade MO versus LOR. That's fine. Yeah. It's not like a long one. It's like, it could be a long set. I'm not going <laughs> to, I got to believe the land of the set. <laughs> You're going to play your stopwatch and be like, three, two. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Begin with some framing. Firstly, the Cold War is ending. This means that funding is largely going to dry up for you. Since the US and Western powers are not particularly interested in winning the global war against communism, and there is no more global war against communism, especially since this has been a brutal war in association with their violence is not particularly positive for them. Know that this decrease in funding is asymmetric, since while the Angolan government doesn't get Soviet funding anymore, they have legitimacy of being a state in the international system with which actors have to make deals with in order to get access to oil. So the deal right now is likely to be the best deal you are ever going to get in terms of both A, belts of power balance, which determines the concessions that each side is willing to make, and B, international recognition, which determines how hard the insurgent groups are treated at the negotiating table, since the punishments and restitution in these deals are largely internationally determined by the UN and other powers. Secondly, you will not win if you go to war. Several reasons. One, extend the framing argument above. Your funding is going down asymmetrically. This makes it hard to sustain the type of long, con large conventional drawn out battles that required to actually overthrow the state. This also means the state can do things like hire PMC groups, which can, which can entirely destroy you through their superior weaponry or coordination. Two, last time you fought, even though you had the advantage of surprise, it ended up in large this domain. Now you no longer have this tactical advantage. The government is aware of how you operate and you no longer have access to cutting edge arms flows. So your ability to adapt is limited and comparatively less than the government's. Plus the government knows you might try to attack to lose the election and has definitely made contingencies. Three, in many ways insurgent groups are structured to survive, not to capture the state. These are very different objectives that require different organizational compositions. Two words. A. Insurgencies like yours rely on a base of power in traditional strongholds, where citizens are unwilling to inform on suspected insurgents because of their ideological alignment with fear or reprisal. Outside of the strongholds, citizens are intolerant of you, especially given that the government has probably heavily propagandized about how evil you are. You are seen as a movement based around or pretending a specific periphery, which citizens of the capital can't empathize with. If citizens inform on you, your ability to survive surprise attacks is just exceptionally low. B. The tactics your fighters are trained in are evasive and reliant on small attacks with quick light upwards in rural areas. This just doesn't prepare them to win conventional battles or do urban warfare, all of which prize very different skills. Our first argument, thus, is internal power struggles. Know that your position as a leader is secure in the status quo. So it works. A, your movement is highly personalist. That is, it relies heavily on your specific charisma and appeal. This means three things. One, the amount of people who hate you within Unida is probably very small. Most of these people have been socialized to think you are a perfect leader and have gone through thick and thin for you. Two, even if people have the desire to overthrow you, they think that you are largely surrounded by a loyal core and hence will be destroyed if they ever choose to do so. Three, even if that wasn't true, the personalist nature of the movement means that any would-be conspirator knows that they would be incapable of leading a successful movement. B, you just managed to secure integration of the military, a huge legitimization for the insurgent movement that gives your fighters cushy job and recognition, and you are set to play an important political role. Even if you lost the election, you got 40% of the vote and are a force to be reckoned with. Returning to war would create the risk of an internal coup for three reasons. One, as we explained in the framing, funding will start to dry up while ideologically motivated fighters might keep going. More transactional UNITA members will start to doubt their participation in the culture risks they undergo without tangible benefits. Moreover, the extent to which ideological fighters are even present is unclear, given you yourself are not particularly ideological and your image depends much on the movement. Given that the punishment for deserting an insurgent movement is usually brutal torture and death, since leaders want deterrence, causes of economically motivated fighters might think their only way out is your death. Two, as we tell you above, integration into the military is a dream job for most of your fighters. You command high levels of social respect and admiration, and importantly, your paychecks are the most likely in Angolan society to come on time, since the president doesn't want to risk defection or overthrows. If people feel that you are denying them that possibility, they might undertake an immediate coup to preserve the peace process and consequent integration. Three, parts of your movement will start to think there's no end in sight. Your denial of what was mostly a fair election and willingness to start up violence after decades of death and devastation, all for the sake of personal aggrandizement, will shower people on the ability of Unida to become a player in the political arena rather than a pawn in an infinite game of war. If people think they will eventually die or watch their families die for an unclear war with no achieving endgame, they'll often be willing to risk death to overthrow you. Note that all of these warrants overcome personalism, since they're by the life or death calculus for individual fighters. They might admire you, but they certainly care about their own families' lives and wealth more so. Now, the outlines say that choosing peace will create the risk of an internal coup from radical factions. This isn't true, several reasons. One, if these factions existed and had the capacity to coup you, they would have already done so when you started entering the peace process since that created immediate risk to their ideological project and to them would be perceived as a deal with the devil. The fact that years of peace negotiations occurred without this coup is pretty strong proof that this risk here is low. Two, you are a personalist leader, which means you've likely sidelined these exceptionally ideological members. Since you worry that their focus on the political project will draw away importance from you, moreover, you likely have also considered 
government back the got to make some kind of deal with the government at some point which would upset these factions and have consequently taken risk management decisions to ensure they cannot kill you three the international community will protect you when you ask for it the example of a rebel leader who accepts his defeat and is willing to then demobilize is a vanishingly rare one and your consequent death will ruin the optimistic narratives that actors like the un like to push about their ability to resolve conflicts internal coups probably outweigh any other argument in this debate for two reasons one on probability the likelihood of violence being done against you might exist for many sources but nowhere is it higher than within a rebel camp where the guns are plenty laws are few and opportunities for the violence abound two magnitude in contrast to other factions the only way for conspirators to get rid of you within the rebel movement is to kill you given your popularity your death is obviously the highest harm in the debate to you as an actor and precludes you from attaining any ideological goals you might otherwise have Second argument is about the counterfactual. If you accept the election result, we think the likely result is that you become a political party leader that specifically represents the interests of your region. Why is this likely? One, no one exists in your region who has anywhere near the level of recognition and power that you do. Even if people in your region want to challenge you, they know that they'd be less effective and certainly have no effective mechanism to do so. Two, this is actually in the interest of the Angolan government as well. Several warrants. A, if they kill or sideline you, they face the near certainty of another rebellion, this time with potential international backing or at least sanctioning, since they were the ones that infringed the rules of the agreement and the international community has fairly strong interest in your survival. B, you are easier to control or at least placate when you're reasonably recognized within society as opposed to on the run or leading a militia. That's because the government can simply set aside a large stream of oil funding earmarked for you or your region to ensure that the quid pro quo is acceptable. Secrets of revenue from oil was skyrocketing off. Officials would be happy to take this deal. C, the devil you know is often better than the devil you don't. And your concession will be seen as a strong signal of agreeability. Sure, the person that might replace you in the event that the government sidelines you or kills you might be less radical, but it's actually likely that there'll be quite a bit more radical since there will be more ideological force the notion of your region's exclusion from politics and there will be independent anger over your removal d it is just hard for the government to kill you they've been trying to do so for the past 15 years and haven't succeeded despite everything failed attempts at killing you are the worst thing they could possibly do so they jeopardize international recognition and further drive potentially less committed individuals towards the unida cause three as we referenced above, the international community will make sure this happens. While the Cold War has ended and with that material support, there's likely at least some latent appreciation for what you did and your charismatic image, both of which is likely to skyrocket given your acceptance of the election. Indeed, there is absolutely a possibility in which you can move to the West and make tons of money on the speaking circuit or as some kind of advisor should you choose. So you'll be protected, empowered, and well-paid. This is great for you. You obtain high levels of recognition and popularity without having to deal with the costs and difficult conditions of war. This is also independently autonomy maximizing since paths open to you in peacetime are just exponentially more than those open during war. So you can choose whatever you feel is best for your personal interests. Proud to propose. All right, as in chain, um, thank you to Brown for hosting. Jerome, thank you to the judges. Ryan, I admire you first as a person, and obviously I've learned a lot about you know debate just from you. Amazing person. Um, just had a great time overall. To opponents, Nod, I love you. You're my big sim. Um, yeah, and to everyone from Yale who's here, thank you for showing out, pulling out. It means a lot. And the body, I really just feel like home and again. So, yeah, good round of following. Okay. We're going to start with the off case and then pretty much follow PM flow just response wise. Okay. <clears throat> Starting my time in three, two, one. You should enter into peace negotiations down the road after you build up pressure on the government such that you leverage your way into a better deal. This looks like one, securing lucrative mining rights, two, ensuring continued independence of UNIDA forces within a unified Angolan government, and three, personal person privileges for you, civility, all of which are better than the deal you're being offered currently in the status quo. Why is this? Number one, you are likely to find success the more that you drag the war out, which means that you are likely to gain territory and manpower, giving you leverage in future negotiations. Couple of reasons for this. Reason number one, the MPLA has partially demilitarized, so this is a unique opportunity at this point in time to ramp up your violence and catch the MPLA off guard. Because we've seen KC with that while the MPLA is partially demilitarized, you have not done so to the same extent. And therefore, they will be forced to scramble to remobilize, which will then be a very violent and chaotic situation that you can exploit to your own strategic advantage. Reason number two, you need to 
been heavily invested in the blood value of industry. So with the Cold War now coming to an end and the world becoming far wealthier as liberalization spreads, you have one, far more markets to sell your blood values to, and two, commodity prices are at an all-time high given investor confidence. So you get tremendous revenue also to fund your operation, buy weapons, train soldiers, etc. So you also have not only the strategic incentive, but you also have the capacity to be able to drive out this war. Now, BMC also talks a little bit about this idea of international intervention. I think we would argue that we want to boost support for our cause. Obviously, in goal is like a post conflict society that overtly hates the West. But when the West intervenes, now you get to portray yourself as like sort of like a bulwark against Western colonialism. This boosts radical support for your organization. Reason number four the MPLA's international backers are sort of war weary and economically destroyed at the end of the Cold War. For example, the USSR is pretty much non existent in 1992. So the MPLA has very little international backing, and its backers want peace, not war. So they'll be hesitant to supply the MPLA with weapons and intelligence. Plus, the US, though, is still suspicious of the MPLA given its communist roots. So they will refuse to back the MPLA, which is a unique opportunity for you to cap the limit. Now, still that okay, the Cold War is ending, neither side has any reason to support, but we tell you that the US is still strategically more advantaged. So even neither side gives a shit ton of money, you're still getting marginally more money on our side of the house, which gives you the incentive and capacity to be able to drive up this war, as we tell you. Now, your personal interests are far better served, again, by maintaining this conflict. A couple of pieces of framing. A, you're not just, just like, you're not likely to die in the war. Remember, this war has been ongoing for decades, and you've already found a way to survive, which implies that you have mechanisms like underground bunkers, bodyguards, etc. etc. Things just objectively work on their side of the house. Why? Reason number one, you're likely to be cooed within Unida on their side. Why? Because hardliners view you as collaborating with the police process and election that they legitimately view as illegitimate. These hardliners are ideological, even if you aren't. So you're your cult of personality, therefore, doesn't matter as much because that has faded as the war has dragged off. Because you've been unable to make huge territorial strides, hence other leaders have likely risen. If you can't show some substance to your leadership, cult of personality isn't going to do jack shit if other people don't believe you and see you as cooperating with the peace process that they perceive as illegitimate. Reason two, once a female, once the MKLA is likely going to breach the peace deal and strip back the rights of your soldiers. Why? Number one, ideological. Obviously, the MPLA is a communist movement that cares more about fighting capitalist pigs like you than they care about upholding a peace deal. So even if they face international pressure, sure they agree to this like accord, like this deal and the accords at first, but that's probably just to like lull you into a state of submission. Number two, even if this doesn't happen at first, the MPLA is like electoral dominance, right? Given that they control urban centers where political and economic power is concentrated. So in the long term, this means that the MPLA's elected government will become increasingly radical as it panders to its urbanized base, which hates the rural parts of the country where you Unida is based. So in the long term, the MPLA as a party radicalizes more on their side of the house and undermines the peace deal. So all of this part about like you fighting the election, I mean, you know, fighting the results to have like a more peaceful state, we argue that it's more conflict on the side of the house just because of the fact that they're likely to um, renege on this deal. The other reason we have is that contesting the results actually demonstrates your commitment to disenfranchised Unida voters. You want to carry favor with your home base, so you actively contest the election results and the signaling effect is a mechanism to show commitment to you, the support that you have for your home base, because you're giving a verbal and like perceptual commitment that you care about enfranchising the people that are most in, crucial for your support. So for all these um, the reasons we tell you that it's more, it, it's better for you to keep this war ongoing for as much as possible because we tell you that it gives you a strategic advantage that um, pushes negotiations in such a way that you get that strategic advantage. Now let's move on to some responses to what we get from the only case. First, they tell you is that, oh, funding is going to dry up for you so you won't have the capacity to be able to push this war. I, 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 my responses are a couple. Number one, the U.S. does still fear a resurgence of communism because, again, the Clinton administration is still hawkish at this time on foreign policy. And even if we buy that, okay, funding, you're not getting the most amount of funding, because at this point in the Cold War, the U.S. has more incentive to keep pushing money, and the U.S. is more economically fiscal and stable. Even if both sides are getting less money on balance, you, your side, is still getting marginally more money. Why is this meaningfully important? Because the other side is already demobilized. So in order for them to remobilize, uh, to like match your military strength, they need double the amount of money. So even though we are getting like marginally like very little money, we are getting enough money to us to allow us to push the war, whereas they're not getting money on their side of the house because we tell you that the U.S. is likely to still continue donating and has the fiscal power to be able to do so. Then that tell you, tells you that, oh, the state can just hire um, PMCs so that, you know, just to fight. And that's a very symmetric argument. You can also hire PMCs and not also argue that you just have like loyalists on your side who don't want a communist party to like take control. So it's probably easier to contract people to fight for you on um, our side of the house. Now let's go into some of the arguments that they make and how they like interact with their own arguments and the fact that I think that the, their first argument sort of beats itself, right? When you talk about cultural personality. 
if you, like Jonas, are as popular as like Gov tries to explain to you, then there's probably just no coup on either side of the house because people believe the propaganda. So both sides, and so far as we may, we make an argument that you will be cued because you're clearly supporting what's illegitimate. They make this argument that you will be cued internationally, you'll, you'll be cued regardless of what you do. I think this point is probably just to watch because if you're super popular and you've indoctrinated all the people in your party, no one really has them to coup either way. So I don't think the coup point should be a delta to which um, they win the argument. Um, then Gov tells you that, oh, and I think that this is also another contradictory point, you can just seek international support if needed, if you feel like you're not stabilized in your party. I think this beats their argument because first they start off front line by telling you, oh, no one is going to fund you. Then they say, oh, just go seek international support. Again, who had the ability to give you international support? The, prep, the most prevalent donors were involved in the Cold War. So the exact country that you could seek to for economic assistance are literally the same countries that we tell you in the beginning of LO that would actually give money to support your cause. So all these arguments about how if you're in a really tight spot, the international community will come and save your ass. I just don't buy that, given the fact that that um, case would like conscience yourself. Okay, now, um, okay, so even though we like sort of like talked about this point about like the coup being a wash on both sides because you have like this cult of personality, it's actually it's just empirically more likely that you are cooed on our side of the house. This is sort of an after motion in that you want to keep support between your uh, like within your party base. Just because thus far you've had some success in developing like a cult of personality doesn't mean that people will continue to buy into you because in order for a leader to be successful, you need to have some sort of like tangible improvements that you've made to the country. You need to show support to your um like you need to show commitment to support us. We achieve that uniquely on our side of the house. If you buy into a peace process that is clearly seen by your supporters that illegitimate it, not only do you isolate and alienate the most hardline supporters of your party, who are therefore most likely to take the most radical action and go against you like the worst coup possible, but we also tell you that you want to keep the moderates of your party engaged. The way you do that is by showing strategic advantages. When they see you clearly doing well by waging this war, capitalizing on the strategic advantage you have because the other side is demobilizing, they're so much more likely to support you. But all of this is predicated on the fact that you're able to continue the war and that you choose to continue the war. Like accepting the peace process and bowing out just basically signal that you don't have an ideological commitment to your movement, which means that even if you have a wonderful cult of personality that you've developed, people are not going to stay affiliated with your movement. And you as an individual care about your movement. You as an individual care about like your personal success, your comfort, things like that. Obviously, if you don't have a movement any longer and no one really supports you, that beats all of our case. So, um, and the, the, and the end point here is that you want to, you want to continue the war for several reasons, but you also want to make sure that you continue the war in such a way that you're able to like buy the support of your party and maintain your position of power. Because as an actor, at the end of the day, the primary objective that you have is to maintain yourself as like the central stronghold and the figurehead of your party. And the only way you can do that is if you prove commitment to your movement. The only way you do that is if you continue the war for all these reasons. Proud to. I'll begin with pleasantries. So uh, thank you to the tournament. I really enjoyed it. My spring break started on Friday and yet I am here, which is a little bit crazy because I like could be home with my dog and my family and everything, but it's been worthwhile, which I think says a lot. Um, so thank you all for putting up the work to make it fun. Uh, thank you to our judges. I hope you all enjoyed this round. I apologize for HIR, long constructs, et cetera, et cetera, but I hope it is enjoyable anyway, and I will do my best to make it so if possible. Uh, thank you to all of the spectators. The same caveats as above apply. Daniel and Andrew. Hey, folks. Um, thank you to our opponents. Nathra, I'm a little bit offended that you uh, only spoke about Nas, but you're <laughs> cool too, I guess. Um, and yeah, uh, I will bring that up later. I think Nas, that's, that's a valid one in PMR, right? You should thank me. Uh, Ryan, you're phenomenal at everything. And um, yeah. An incredible debater, and I'm really excited to get to run this case against you and Adra. This should be really fun. Okay. Uh, is everyone good? The claim from the off is that the U.S. is not going to support anyone, and that the U.S. is anti-communist, so they won't like the MPLA. The MPLA is going to be not communist anymore. Why is that true? 
One, they are already selling plenty of oil to the U.S. A, generally movements that pretend to be communist to secure Soviet funding during the Cold War, but often in of themselves didn't really care about politics. Now that Soviet funding is no longer an important prospect, they have no incentive to keep up the charade. B, the MPLA probably does not want to get cooed by the U.S. If their arguments were true that the Clinton administration is still hawkish, the MPLA also knows this and is that holding on to communism incurs the risk of the U.S. wanting to intervene against them. So they will respond accordingly by decommunizing themselves. C, they want to sell oil, and that is their main industry. They know that selling oil to the very, very poor and declining Eastern Bloc and super war weary Eastern Bloc, as per their very own arguments, is way less lucrative than selling it to the far richer and more resourced West. And fourthly, it is likely they've already been engaging with the West, so requiring the substantial amounts of capital to set up oil rigs and refineries. Capital was the late 80s Soviet Union, which was near the brink of collapse, losing a drawn out war in Afghanistan, is not going to be there to provide. The end point of this argument is that the MPLA is no longer going to be communist. This. They're not going to be ideological, and they will actively posture to get U.S. support. Why does this then flip the round to God? One, the MPLA will offer the U.S. better oil deals than you ever could. Three reasons. A, they already have the infrastructure set up, whereas you could not, even if you managed to obtain control of some of the oil-producing regions. B, they want to persuade the U.S. to get be friendly, and thus are more likely to provide the U.S. better deals to compensate for the former communist background. And C, even if you say you will offer the U.S. better deal, the U.S. does not trust you, especially since you just broke a U.N. brokered peace deal. And secondly, the continuation of conflict impinges on the ability to extract oil. A, companies and refineries will charge a significant risk premium because of the war, and B, governments can't expand production as much when they're caught up in trying to fight. The implication of all of these arguments is that, firstly, the U.S. will actually try to fund your destruction, since A, they want to end the war as quickly as possible, but that your destruction is quicker because the government has the initial money and the power centers already, and B, they will further improve their international image, and funding the government is better to do so once you abandon the peace process and you're a brutal rebel group, and C, they just prefer the MPLA to stay in power for the reasons I've given you above. The second implication of these arguments as if the responses of like the MPLA has to become super communist to appeal to their voter base are just not true. The MPLA was communist to try to get Soviet funding, but they no longer have to do so. They're a pragmatically oriented political group, meaning that if the arguments give you on PMC as to why it is pragmatically bad for them to isolate you more, all of which are conceded by the LOC are true, then it is just not the case that they would seek to isolate you in the future. The LOC proper. The first thing they make is that you can basically just threaten the government into giving you better concessions. Three responses. One, the government obviously would suffer a huge credibility hit if they allowed this. Hard enough within the government things like who the government if they said that you are giving in to Zavimi. Secondly, this creates a terrible incentive structure for the government. That is, if every single time Zavimi makes a further threat, they concede more to him, the natural extension to just overthrow them. So they have strong evidence to not be willing to do this. And thirdly, you will not get integration. For you to have the military integrated into the and goal in military that requires you to first demobilize and crucially having the ability to have your military within the Angola military is the most leverage because you can literally say I will pull out my soldiers from your military I will kill you internally so they have strictly worth leverage on their side the top level, though, is that their observation is correct. That probably you should try to hold down with the government later. But only we get from that by staying in the speech process. When can we actually be able to threaten them? A, you can say, well, we have powerful parts within their military. B, when oil prices are low and the government is in financial ruin, we can campaign against them as a legitimate political party. And C, we can le leverage the mistakes that happened in the elections. If their arguments are true, if people care a lot about the fact that, oh, there was some kind of rigging, then you can force them to concede by saying, look, the U.S. is saying that there was rigging his election, you should give me more rights as a result. This both beats the top level of the LOC, but also beats the argument about later rights stripping. Because it's really good to just threaten them later more effectively, then we can also stop them from stripping our rights later. They say that you're going to be largely demilitarized, so you can just cause this some epic surprise attack. Three responses. One, they've certainly been the most important areas of their government. Secondly, they have disposed their military that the remaining military they have in ways to deal with your attack as with the PMC argument that is actively just conceded. And thirdly, if we get more money on the MPLA side of things, they can just do these like five PMC. So this is asymmetric, which prove the US only gets involved in one world. They say you can sell diamonds. One, far harder for them to do so. What is a blood diamond, guys? It's the LOC term. It was diamonds that got blacklisted during the Sierra Leone war from being sold because the U.S. government and other uh, big diamond real dealers said we're no longer going to buy from conflict zones. And given this is a thing that can happen and you offset the U.S. by doing this, your diamonds just don't get sold anywhere. And secondly, diamonds are far less lucrative than oil. Four reasons why A, lab grown diamonds exist and are increasing right now. B, far more other alternatives for diamonds exist than exist for oil. C, diamonds are hugely more labor intensive and less profitable. And D, and you need to also control from the diamond mines. They control all of the oil 
the diamond mines are split. So the oil is far more powerful, even if diamonds somehow could get you some kind of money. They say that, oh, your, your backers, the idea, and MPLA's backers are gone. If the U.S. becomes a backer, we still win. And even if they don't have backers, they can see they get huge majority from oil revenue, which is just enough to pay whatever they need to do so. The U.S. argument is beat. The hard of argument is being like five times the PMC, but I'll clarify that debate later. They say that the color of personality has dragged down. One, this is true about your ideological claims. If your idea is, I'm going to create a capitalist joke in Angola, and you say this is 1975, and now it's 1991, and we're no closer to that utopia, then currently the ideologues they talk about will have abandoned the movement or died or lost faith far more than the personalist people will have gone. If your cult of personality was going to be gone, it was going to be gone a long time ago. People are hanging up because they genuinely do believe in you. Secondly, even if these people exist within your movement, which is something that we say could be the case, you will have sidelined them or already killed them. So the fact that they might exist is comparatively less risky. That's what they're messing about your risk management. They say the FPLA will strip your rights. This is being by literally all of PMC on the question of why they, one, would prefer to keep you in power, and two, all of the overview level. They say you will show commitment. Two responses. One, flip this. Commitment is the idea that you are actually fighting for their rights. But if you're just infinitely fighting for war, that doesn't seem to commit to their rights. It's a commitment to your own advancement. The other that now you are able to get them to the military only on ours and a tangible benefit from them. So you can go to the negotiating people and say, look, I'll be mobilized, but some bad things happen. Let's work on it. That's what actual commitment looks like. Secondly, the brain of this argument is very, very unclear. You've been at war for 15 years. Presumably many other events happen which could trigger a lot of commitment, yet you will still stick by you. So it's very until this argument actually triggers. Okay, on to the PMC. I think most of it is very undercovered, so I enjoy, will enjoy seeing the MO try to get through all of the warrants. The first thing they make is, ah, there's a knife. Because if you're popular, they can't be a coup. I mean, yes, if you don't listen to any of the PMC, then I guess there is, but if you do, then there isn't. Why is that true? One, because we explain the kinds of things that would make fighters coup in our world are things that overcome personalism, i.e. your life and death, your family, the belief in the leader in and of itself. That's why our words actually do prove that there could be a coup. And secondly, the question is asymmetric. That is to say that ideology is very easy to undermine. There's ways to speak against ideology, and clearly ideology has been kind of thrown to the wind in these 15 years. But you have consistently hanged on to your power in all of this time. They say that going to seek support is a knife because international communities as clearly as one support you. Two responses. One, this requires you to accept the deal in the first place. We've conditioned all of our national arguments on the international community saying you were a good, you did a good job, you did the thing you were supposed to do. So it's not a knife, it's asymmetric. And secondly, the zero between the international community wanted to fund an actual war and still providing you with like an escape from the war. And as long as the international community is sympathetic enough for you to be able to get out at Angola or have some protection, we still win all the necessary portions of this argument. Argument. They say you want to keep support, you do so through tangible change. Great dumb argument. The only side that gets an actual tangible change over the status quo of 15 years of war is the gov. We say we integrate the military fundamentally. There's nothing they can do about that because the international community is watching. Their oil system dependent on it. And if you don't integrate properly, you can rebel. So there's literally no way to get out of it. And it's the most easy and tangible and powerful change you can make. Very fast to oppose. Uh, brief pleasantries, Brown, fantastic tournament, tons of fun. Absolutely wonderful partnering with you. It's been legitimately such a blast, a fantastic, fantastic time. Also, I know everyone, I know that like true friends on side, opposite side is like a horribly overblown meme at this point. So I should probably not use that phrase, but uh, what's a synonym for true? Um, valid companions on side affirmative. Uh, always a pleasure to debate, lots of fun. Uh, warning, this will be off flow, so you can probably float on the off please. I'll try to fly across apps as possible. There are four ways you vote in this round. The first is on Savimbi's interests. 
If you're confused by this point in the round, I wouldn't blame you because about 85% of PMC and MG is generic analysis about the conflict writ large with little explanation of where that aligns with Savimbi's best interests. The most important question to ask in the debate prior to any of the Gov material is from the perspective of Savimbi, what does this guy want and what side best fulfills those interests? So let's characterize the best interests of Savimbi and then explain why even in the best case for Gov, you should vote off. What does Sidimbi want? We know for his background, he's not ideological. He's been fighting a war against a more powerful, better funded force for decades. What does that suggest about what Sidimbi wants? One, it suggests that he as an individual is not interested in the types of benefits that PMC is offering him. What is the best outcome for Gov? The best outcome for Gov is Sidimbi lives a comfortable, cushy life in the capital city of Angola. He is given a share of oil revenues and some degree of comfort. But that was never what was in Sidimbi's best interests. Why do we know that's true? This is a man who has spent his entire life fighting a conflict, not for ideological reasons, but because that is the bread and butter of his life. He has become accustomed to the lifestyle of a guerrilla. He finds true meaning and true joy in the process of fighting. There's a powerful analogy to Colombia in 2016. Why is it that so many FARC militants, even though FARC writ large agreed to let their arms down, continued the war nonetheless? It's because absorbing into civilian life was not in their best interests. They could have lived meaningfully better, materially richer, more stable lives, but they much preferred the lifestyle of a guerrilla vigilante. Why? Because that is the, the culture they have been inculcated into. From a young age, they have been grown up to believe the best thing they could do with their life is to fight against the enemy. It is true, Sudimbi is not an ideologue, but he is a guerrilla in his DNA. Why is this an important argument for the debate? The government team mischaracterizes egregiously the nature of 21st century or late 20th century insurgency. The way that Savimbi wages this war is not trying to capture the entirety of Angola. He's not trying to win the entire country. Rather, what he's doing is he's controlling specific rural areas, encroaching upon specific villages where his UNITA forces believe they have some capacity for influence. The reason this is the most likely characterization is because he's not a dumbass. He's been fighting this war for decades and knows very well that he's unable to capture the entire country and is unlikely to make any attempt to do so. This has two implications for the round. First, the style of warfare that Unita is engaged in is relatively not capital intensive. He is not waging large scale militarized blitzkriegs on the capital city. Rather, he is launching small scale attacks on the rural, rural outskirts, whereby he is able to make incremental gains in the long term. This fulfills his interests in seeing Unita grow as a movement through the violent military means he believes is best for the movement. The second implication is it sidesteps almost all all of the PMC material on infighting because MG says the reason a coup happens on our side is because people care more about their life than they care about the cult of personality or unsubimity. True, but the style of insurgency you are fighting is not deathly and bloody by nature. You incur minimal casualties because you are fighting in heavily under-militarized regions of the country where there is not large-scale tank presence, where artillery fire is kept to a minimum, where there is an incapacity for the state to repress you violently. That means the infighting material from PMC is out because the PMC's own warranting on the strength of this cult of personality is the reason people are unlikely to coup. And therefore, the way it is very simple. You as an actor are best served fighting a low, a low intensity insurgency that brings you tremendous meaning and tremendous joy at every moment. And moving into civilian lifestyle incurs severe cognitive dissonance. You live a horrible life. You might be rich, you might live in the capital city, but you feel like this is not what you were meant to do. That causes profound emotional distress prior to any of the material from PMC. All of that means that you outweigh this argument above all else. It is the most proximate interest of this actor and outweighs any PMR collapse. The best PMR potential response is, well, Ryan, if all of this is true, then why did he try to negotiate peace in the first place? Clearly, he would have just kept fighting. The obvious answer is, it's a strategic bargaining chip. You periodically come to the table to negotiate for strategic advantages for your movement and subsequently back out. This is what paramilitary groups all the time, and the reason they do this all the time is because they understand the broad, long-term military interests of the movement are best served through temporarily seeking ceasefires, then breaking those ceasefires down the road and advancing the cause. Let's move into the hard thing.
The second ballot for our side was on military integration failing either way. There's a cool country just a little near Angola called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. If you know anything about the DRC, they've tried to integrate their militaries, and it has caused 20 plus years of bloodshed. The same thing will happen on their side of the house because the attempted integration of UNITA and MPLA fighters is destined to fail no matter how much MPLA wants it to succeed. Why is that? First, a lack of historical experience. The MPLA has never successfully reintegrated a different military force into its military unlikely to work here. Second, the United States oil corporations all I talk so much about have strong incentives to pressure the MPLA into rapidly expediting the integration process as much as possible, which means long-term there's a greater risk that you haven't properly integrated your forces. You haven't ensured that the right commanders are supervising the right platoons, which increases the risk of infighting. Third, there inevitably are mass disagreements within the process of reintegration as to how you should reintegrate. A very tangible example of this, for example, is Insurgent groups often care very deeply about retaining their original insignias, retaining their culture, retaining their identity. You fought with these people, you consider them your brothers. And the idea of being integrated into a military where that is stripped away is an existential attack on your identity. The problem inevitably is disagreements over that process are heated because integration requires breaking down the socio-cultural fabric of the guerrilla unit, which means this is destined to fail. Fourth and lastly, even if the integration process succeeds at first. What inevitably happens is there's one individual case where some UNITA soldier shoots an MPLA soldier, where one individual case of instability occurs, and then the entire system falls apart as other factions mutiny, as the rest of the UNITA forces see MPLA as being evil. That means inevitably, no matter how good the incentives of the MPLA are, no matter how anti-communist the MPLA is, this process is destined to fail. If the process is destined to fail, vote off because you minimize all of the risks, even if they're 5% from LOC from ever manifesting. If the peace deal fails either way, you are better fighting the war in its continual form as opposed to temporarily accepting a deal which weakens your position by requiring demobilization to then restart the war where you are now fighting on the back foot. Their best argument here is, aha, but there are incentives. The problem is capacity comes prior to incentive. Third ballot on internal coups. Their argument is you get an internal coup on our side. Problem with this argument is none of the mechanisms justify the conclusion. Why is that? Because individual UNITA soldiers do not believe as strongly in this deal as they suggest. Why? Because for decades, they've been inculcated into propaganda that convinces them the MPLA is their God-sworn enemy. And maybe they're not ideological, but they're scared on practical grounds. These guys will kill and assault us. But furthermore, it's because they don't believe that you can message this smartly as a leader, use your charisma to justify this as a short-term step. Pause briefly, because uh, I'm just going to signal. This is this is where MO cuts out, so now you can PLO. All right. At that point in time, you can whip, vote off cleanly on all of the material on internal coups. Why? The first reason is the LO argument is actually immune to the MG response, because the LOC argument is the greatest risk you face is from a small number of hardliners being so devoutly opposed to your accepting of this peace deal. The MG response misses the mark. It's not to say that these people were previously supportive of you. Our claim from the outset of LOC is these people were always opposed to a peace deal. And the specific bright line of accepting a deal, of laying down your arms, of participating in a system they do not view as legitimate, is the greatest threat to your internal stability. Here's the weighing question you're probably asking at this point. There are two competing visions of which side is better or worse off for reducing the risk of internal coups. Why is opposition's material more compelling? Three types of reasons. The first reason is our material affects the group that is much more immune to all of the reasons you otherwise wouldn't coup, which is just to say, PMC is right. Most people in the UNITA force are never going to coup because they love you and view you as a father figure who has bred the movement from its beginnings. The question then is, given the average UNITA soldier is not engaged in any form of insurrection, the type of insurrection you should care the most about is the type of person most immune to that cult of personality. This is the group identified in LOC. Yes, they are small, but the point is a small group with the capability of inflicting mass violence on you specifically is all it takes for you to fucking die. The reason that matters is, 
even if they are right and there are more people on their side of the house who want to coup, they are the least likely to coup and they have the least ability to coup compared to the highly hardline people willing to do whatever it takes to advance their ideology. And there's five layers of MG mitigation on this argument, but the point is not that these people, as MG explains, never exist. It's that they exist in a large enough quantity that this is the tipping point for them. And it's what you as an actor believe is most the greatest tipping point and the greatest threat to your personal interests. The second reason our material outweighs any potential gov claim vis-a-vis -vis internal instability is on a consideration of reversibility. Because our argument is the best way you increase your support long term is by continuing the war, which gives you continued access to resources, continued access to manpower that allows you to continue the fight you have propagandized your forces into believing. Remember. It's not to say that the average soldier is ideological, but the average soldier does not believe peace works. The average soldier believes working with the other side is a death sentence for them, not on the basis of anti-communism, but on the basis of hating the MPLA. They were the ones killing your families. They are the people bombing your houses, which means the average MPLA soldier is not as willing to take the cushy government jobs they outline. Therefore, our material on infighting is more likely to occur if you buy the PMC weighing that this is the most important issue. Yeah, um, I, this might be somewhere else, but I think the argument that the average MPLA fighter doesn't care about the, job, the, the potential to get a cushy government job seems like a new response. I think I'm fine with playing to like the disruptive government general in a specific application to this means they will want to take a military job so they will want to. So the specific word average is not present in the MO argument, but above, I forget exactly. Let me actually find the exact place. So yeah, so it's under the, uh, do, do, it's, there's basically an MO argument that says uh, these people have for a very long time been told and taught and trained to view the MPLA as like bad slash a threat. Um, I suppose the argument I'm just making is like a statistical argument that's like the average person probably believes this and hence like doesn't want to work for the group that they view as evil, basically. I think the second person you have to be Okay. Um, I've got oh, like 130 left, yeah. roughly. Yeah. I, I need to always do the time in my head because it's 1230, which gets funky. Okay. But more importantly, the very bottom of MO beats the gov argument. Why? Because the bottom of MO warrants that you are able to justify and rationalize this decision towards the moderate supporters they are describing. And given PMC's characterization that people trust you, you are able to moderate their anger specifically. So gov has very little offense on the question of internal fracturing. Op has a more consistent narrative for how it is that you die and lose your power. The second ballot more generally is on military conflict and your ability to succeed. The key strategic note for Op is our material works, even given the 11,000 words of mitigation coming from PMC and MG, because the thesis of how you win this war is not by vanquishing the MPLA, but rather by waging a low intensity, low cost mode of war there. Why is this relevant? Because it accesses all of the LOC warranting as to why eventually you increase pressure sufficiently to get a better deal down the road if it is the case that that is what you want to adjudicate the round on. And the reason this is important is it sidesteps the government preemption because knowledge of tactics means jack shit when you are targeting areas that are so under-militarized there is no meaningful pushback. Your inability to access funding is insubstantial in a context where you are waging a war in which you do not need high power artillery. The fact that we're outgunned and outmanned does not matter given the type of warfare you are pushing. If you want a better deal, you get it. Oppose. They will actually largely follow the order of the MO. Ballots will be integrated and weighed and flagged through responding to the MO. Ballots. The first thing that MO talks about is Savimbi's interest. They say that you've adjusted to the life of a guerrilla fighter and will never want to do anything else. 
The issue is the arguments made in the MG and the PMC as to why you acceded to elections in the first place, why you were willing to engage in political processes, and why you were likely to be willing to concede and continue the peace accords if you had won the election in the first place. Now, the argument from Brian is that none of this matters because you're just using it as a key bargaining chip. But A, this is not responsive to the initial claim, which is that if you had won the elections, you would have continued with the peace accords. Secondly, though, this argument flows gov for the MG overview. That is to say, you are able to use this as a bargaining chip in our world once you are integrated into the military, once you do have political power, and you are able to have a much better bargaining chip in our world than in their world. Why is this the case? Firstly, because you have much larger ability to have leverage over the government. You control parts of the military. You are much more able to have control over funding. You're much more likely to be able to gain access to these oil rigs, for instance, in our world, as opposed to in their, their world where they have none of it. Secondly, and crucially, was the arguments just flat out conceded from the MG about USA support going to the MPLA. That is to say, in their world, you get huge massive amounts of US ability to engage um, with the MPLA that do not allow for NIDA to gain any level of power. Why does this argument win us the round? Because in our world, you are much more likely to get the USA to support you. Because you're seen as a leader that was willing to back down from these um, war processes in the first place. You are likely to get funding. You are likely to be able to get deals with these or with these for diamond deals, for oil deals, etc., in ways that you are unlikely to get on their side. And this USA support, crucially, is what allows you to gain a bargaining chip over the MPLA. Because once you have Western support on our side, you are much more able to be able to credibly threaten the government and much less able to than in their world. Whereas on their side of the house, we're much more likely to see USA support uh, the MPLA and much more likely to see yourself entirely vanquished. Why does this win us the round? One, because we explained to you that you're likely to be a regional political leader on our side that is able to have large controls over rural areas that is able to gain political power and eventually in the future win the presidency or gain huge amounts of power that is able to succeed. The whole reason you are fighting is for political control in the first place. It is not just that you have adjusted to the life of a guerrilla warrior. And the revealed preference arguments we made above means that what you desire more than just this ability is the ability to gain power. Secondly, on our world, you are able to engage with the West in ways that allow you to expand this power. So for instance, you can become a policy advisor and weaken the MTLA or in other ways which are never possible on their set of house. Thirdly, you're much more able to gain the ability to fight a guerrilla war on our side. So if you want to vote off in the future, you are much more able to do that on our side because you have much more control over the military, much more control over money. So if you care about fighting in the guerrilla war, we're voting gov on this question. Second thing to talk about is integration. They say that this integration is going to be messy. It's going to cause a lot of problems when you're fighting side by side with each other. The obvious simple response to this is that you can just keep military platoons that are UNITA composed and UNITA commanded, and these are perhaps separate from the MPLA, but they're generally part of the national military. Secondly, if this ballot is true, and this ends up resolving into war anyways, this means Ryan's first ballot, which is about your desire to attend war, that uh, uh, get into war, which means that in either side you're probably going to have some level of war if you believe this ballot, but we're actually much better able to get that war because you have much more leverage and you have much more control because you actually have people on the ground, you have funding, you have less support, etc. Thirdly though, this way this integration is done is fun to you uh, as MPLA, as NATO fighters, as being able to coup the government in the future, you are able to hold control, particularly for the hardliners they talk about. This is something that you're more able to use as a levering chip. So you're going to have multiple narratives that appease the hardliners on our side, as well as keeping moderate folks happy by being able to gain meaningful material benefits to themselves. Maybe they don't care about the cushy uh, government job, but they certainly do care about having a life they can live that is meaningfully good. Finally, on to turn on coups and hardliners. One, we already told you that these people have accepted the peace deal and they have not cooed you yet, which indicates the likelihood of hardliners cooing you is very small in this debate. Secondly, you've already made contingencies about these people. You've sidelined them. You've ensured that they do not have access to you and you know who these people are and have ensured that they will not have an ability to get to you in the first place. So what's the way here? Maybe they're correct that these people have more motivation to kill you, but they never prove the capacity question. I would tell you they have less access to ways that are actually able to kill you because you ensure that they are not in space that you are around, that these people are constantly being watched by your most loyal supporters. Secondly, there's just a lot less of them than the average moderate person who is much more likely to be disaffected on their side of the house for a lot of reasons. They say, actually, Angola is under, or the UNITA is fighting in areas that are under-militarized, and so these people do not face harms to themselves. The issue with this argument is that it's just like flat out wrong. I, if you're all collectivized in one village, the government would just bomb that village. So these people are certainly spread out 
out and they're, yes, engaging in guerrilla tactics, but they're not engaging in ways that are possible. The way in this debate is very simple. If you get crushed by the United States, which is a conceded argument, you cannot continue your guerrilla war, you lose or killed, get imprisoned, etc., which seems to beat the off entirely, and you are less likely to be able to formalize all the stuff they talk about. In our world, you are able to gain political power and use that as a bargaining chip later that allows you to hold on to much more control and engage in this fighting later on. Proud to propose.